Hi, my name's Keith. In this video, I'll be going over the repair and restoration of a sequential circuits Model 800 sequencer. Now, I've done a few videos in the past with the Model 800, but this one is special. When my client brought it in, the first thing they told me was that it was serial number three. Yes, only three. This means that this was the third one to come out of the assembly process. So even though it might superficially look like every other Model 800, it's a significantly different in some respects on the inside, and also there are some changes to the interface jacks on the back. So uh, the first thing I'll do before I get into the repairs is I'll just uh, give an overview of what's wrong with this one and uh, some of the cosmetic issues. Okay, so the overall condition is pretty good. Uh, one of the first things you'll notice is the original Sequential Circuits logo. It's supposed to look like a little chip or something, so that's pretty cool. Also, around the speed, um, uh, uh, the legend around the speed knob, there's some markings with a paint stick or something. Somebody obviously in the studio was trying to keep track of tempo, so hopefully, uh, you know, I can get rid of that with some isopropyl alcohol. Um, also, it's pretty obvious that the button cap for the stop record button is missing. That should be red and it should match the green one for record start. Um, and the, uh, the stem on this push button is a little bent. So I'm either going to replace both of these switches so they uh, look and feel identical, or if I can finesse this uh, back into shape, I might just replace the uh, button caps again just so that it, it, uh, they look similar. So uh, I can turn it on, and it lights up. So that's uh, good news. At least we know, in general, things work a bit. Um, uh, if I turn the clock on and crank the speed, I I'm expecting the position counter to start cycling from 0 to 15, and the memory uh, bank LEDs to start uh, cycling through all the memory banks. Even uh, if there's just garbage in it, like I just turned it on, it should at least cycle through um, all the memory locations. So this is telling me that there's probably something wrong with the internal clock circuit. Uh, now, I can manually step through. You can see the, uh, the counter is going up, and then when I hit the 15th note, which is actually the 16th because it starts at zero, I do one more, it gets to zero, and the memory bank LED advanced from one to two. So I know that the clock distribution circuit is working okay, uh, but there's something wrong uh, with, the with the actual clock generator. Now, I can also put it uh, in record mode, and uh, normally you would have to feed this a gate from a monosynth, and every time you push down a key, it would increase the position counter. Now, I had already tried this earlier uh, before I made the video, uh, uh, and it wasn't working. So that tells me that there's something wrong with the uh, gate threshold uh, circuit uh, on the gate input. Um, so I'll have to look at that as well. But one thing I can do is um, there's a switch on the back that chooses between um, shorting versus voltage style gates. That, and when I wiggle that, it actually introduces noise on the clock circuit uh, line. So it does um, kind of erratically jump around and advance the position counter. So at least I know in record mode, the clock distribution circuit uh, also works. So that's some good news. Uh, so let me flip it around and we'll look at the back. So on the back, uh, it shows a serial number. This is 800-003, so that's model 800 uh, number three. Um, Sequential Circuits Company, uh, San Jose, California. So um, just like the front, there's some markings with some paint stick or something on the back. Um, I guess that was keeping track of what uh, the default settings should be uh, in the studio, so hopefully I can get rid of that. Um, also, the external clock in, uh, it's supposed to be a four-pin Cinch Jones connector, kind of like this one here, but a four-pin style. And at some point, it was retrofitted with a quarter-inch jack. Now, I'll probably keep that because this is a much more uh, popular style connector, um, but the, the actual mounting of this jack is a bit bodged. Um, there's some holes. You can kind of see right into the sequencer. There's a screw missing, and it's just it's a little loose, and I'll just probably put a nice uh, mounting plate there and redo that. Um, one other thing you probably noticed is the cord. At some point, somebody cut the, uh, the power cord. I don't know why. this. I see this all the time on synths and studio equipment. People cut the cord, and then there's this cord. It looks like it's from a, a lamp. It's got kind of a cheesy lamp on-off switch and a, a like kind of a, 
a, a cheap uh, two-prong connector and this blue tape. So I will definitely be replacing that because this is uh, not safe at all. Uh, so before I pop the top and look at the inside though, let's look at the, uh, the foot switch. So this is the foot switch and uh, it also has the uh, old style uh, sequential circuits logo. Uh, and anybody that's uh, seen a Model 800 foot switch before is probably wondering, what are these two red lights? Because usually there's a single switch here to turn the clock on and off. This is a, a toggle switch. And there's usually a momentary switch, again, it's like a guitar pedal style switch, that turns the record mode on and then another momentary switch for record mode off. But instead, at some point, somebody has retrofitted this foot switch um, with this toggle here that actually chooses between record mode on and record mode off. And they replace the switches with uh, these two uh, lenses. There's a green lens and a red lens uh, for record uh, start and stop. And there's a flashlight style bulb uh, inside. And also, um, inside I found uh, this uh, corroding, uh, ancient, ever-ready 9-volt uh, battery. So, um, what I'm planning on doing is uh, I'm going to get rid of the switch and uh, change these back to the switches, the regular switches, to get this totally back uh, to the same functionality it once had. Uh, let me open up the sequencer and we can look at the circuit board. So, this is the inside of the Model 800. And if you've seen my other video, this will all look very familiar. The most obvious difference is this box here in the corner. On the uh, later versions of this sequencer, um, this is where the DAC is, and it's made of a uh, resistor ladder, six transistors, and an op amp as a buffer. It's kind of a do-it-yourself DAC. This uh, earlier version of the sequencer, on the other hand, has an integrated DAC. This is a 10-bit DAC in this huge package. Now, uh, on my web posting and in my description of the, um, the later versions of the sequencers, I stated that to get a 5-octave range of CVs, uh, to record a 5-octave range of CVs, you really only needed a 6-bit DAC. Um, that gives you 63 discrete notes or levels or voltages. And that's if, assuming you're not um, recording a pitch band or a, a modulation of the pitch or anything like that. So you might be wondering why um, they would bother using this expensive package with 10 bits. Well, this is related to being able to support the earlier um, uh, Korg and Yamaha synths because instead of a one volt per octave standard, they used uh, a hertz per volt. It doubles the voltage as you go up each octave and halves the voltage as you go down. It's an exponential response. So what happens is you go down the keyboard, the voltage, the difference in voltage between each of the semitones gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So ultimately you need more resolution at the low end. So that's why you need the 10-bit DAC because if you tried to record uh, uh, hertz per volt uh, synth with only six bits, the low end would be way out of tune. Um, the only other visual difference, the main other visual difference, is this daughter board here, and it's connected to this potentiometer. And if you actually follow all the leads, um, these flying leads all over the place, um, you'll notice that it's connected to the, uh, the uh, clock, the input clock, the external input clock. And what this is, is it's a level detector and a buffer to the input clock. And there, it, what it allows you to do is uh, uh, vary the level so that you can use a different variety or a wider variety of clock sources. So if you have like a 5 volt clock or a 10 volt clock or even just a really hot audio signal like a click, um, you can use this uh, level potentiometer and this uh, buffer circuit here will allow you to adjust to be able to use that as your clock source. In the later versions of the sequencer, this circuit is actually incorporated onto the circuit board. So I've had a few repair sessions now with the uh, Model 800 and I basically have things working again. I replaced the low voltage capacitors uh, in the power supply circuit on the main board. I replaced about mm, half a dozen flaky or dead logic chips. I fixed the clock circuit and I replaced the uh, comparator on the gate input. 
uh, so now it can actually record the sequences. And I also cleaned up a ton of messy wiring, flaky wiring, and bad solder joints. So things are much more uh, stable. I can actually record a sequence. So um, I'll just put it in record mode. And I will uh, flip the top up so that you can see the counter. And I will record a short sequence into it uh, using my MS-20 Mini. And this will also show that the uh, higher resolution of the DAC of these uh, earlier Model 800s can actually record uh, Hertz per volt synthesizers uh, that require more precision. So uh, let me just put in a short sequence. So there we go, and it can record, and it's looping, and you can probably see the counter uh, advancing here. Um, here, I'll just turn it off for a second. Now, uh, with the MS-20 Mini, there are actually two envelope generators, and I'm using the first one. It's a simple uh, attack uh, release envelope generator, so there's only uh, two stages. There's a second envelope generator, and it's a full ADSR envelope. So if I patch it, so that it uses the second envelope generator, something interesting happens. So this is using envelope generator one. Now I'll change to envelope generator two. It doesn't trigger at all. And I know the triggers are still coming from the unit because if I patch uh, envelope generator one back in, it works again. So what's going on? I tried uh, my ARP Odyssey, Moog Source, uh, some earlier uh, Paya uh, modular gear, some Eurorack gear. I tried all sorts of different synthesizers and sometimes it would trigger and sometimes it wouldn't. So I was wondering, well, what's the deal? Uh, I captured the uh, trigger waveform on my storage oscilloscope. And there it is. And it turns out that the pulse is only about two milliseconds long. And that's not reliable enough to trigger an envelope generator, uh, especially with uh, older analog gear. You need at least mm, five, sometimes 10 milliseconds uh, uh, of gate time to reliably start an envelope generator. So then I looked uh, on the board, in, on the, uh, inside the uh, Model 800, at the 74-123 monostable. It's just a, a, a pulse generator chip. Uh, you can also make oscillators out of it. And uh, I uh, looked at the capacitor that sets the time constant. So I'll give you a close-up of that. This is the 74-123 monostable. And this reddish-brown tantalum capacitor determines the time constant for the trigger. And there's something interesting. All of the other uh, tantalum capacitors on the board are blue. This is the only red one. And it's also kind of bodged in there, and there's a little bit of corrosion. So I don't think this is original uh, to the unit. And somebody had done a repair or replacement uh, in the past, and they didn't do a good job. So what I'll do is I'll figure out what, what value of capacitor I should use uh, to give it a nice 10 millisecond uh, uh, gate for the uh, trig out and then hopefully these trigger problems will go away. And I also have a lot of other repairs to do uh, anyway. I have to fix um, the external clock circuit, the external clock jack on the back. I haven't replaced the line cord yet. I'm surprised I haven't started a fire yet. And I haven't even looked at the foot pedal. So uh, I have more repairs to do. At this point, I finished all the repairs on the Model 800 and it's fully functional. I've also cleaned up all the cosmetic issues. There are no more marks. Uh, there are new button caps. There's now both a green and a red button cap for uh, start and stop record. Uh, on the foot pedal, uh, I've replaced uh, the stop and start record uh, switches with the original ones. The original switch has gotten rid of the lights. I plugged all the holes. I put some new feet on it. So everything uh, looks and works great. And I've been working on a second video synchronizing the Model 800 with external devices like drum machines or tape sync or external clocks. And uh, here's a sneak preview. Thanks for watching.